so here's uh problem set three uh so it's basically two two problems um uh here they're both you can see they're both expanding varieties so they have the same or not exactly the same but they have that same sort of epsilon aggregation with uh, an expanding number of varieties n okay and essentially the first thing we're doing is thinking about scale effects okay so we kind of i kind of swept that under the carpet um when we did expanding varieties and now when we're doing creative destruction Schumpeterian models, uh, you know, it's just sort of like either taking a fixed population or uh, having, assuming a unit population. Okay, so um, here uh, what we're gonna do is, is throw back in this fact that you could have a population of say L, which we usually have instead of one. Um, see what happens, that's like part B, and we'll see that basically you, know, you get a growth rate that's a function of the population size, which is not good, um, because that means you'd have exponentially growing growth rates, okay? Uh, that's that's scale effects, right? That's because, um, you know, if you, ha if you, if you increase the, the number of people in the population, you increase the number of researchers, and if that increases growth proportionally, or even not, you know, just in some way, then you're going to get an increasing growth rate uh, with the size of a population, which is just not what we see in the world, right? So, um, so, so first, seeing okay, that doesn't work. We need to figure out what to do, and and then sitting, you know, setting up this Jones style uh, research uh, production function, and kind of fixing that scale effect issue, okay? And then we'll see what happens. So then now, the only thing is like, you know. In Jones, remember when we did just regular old Jones, uh, we um, we found that the growth rate when when phi was not equal to one outside of that the knife edge case where phi equals one, we found that the growth rate is just you know some function of parameters, but it's not a function of you know the research share or anything like that. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Michael, I think you got your I think you got your mic uh, unmuted there. Okay, no, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, Nothing, nothing crazy. I just, you know, some, some glasses clinking and stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So the, um, that, that Jones, you find that you get this growth rate that's just comes out from, from the, the, basically the population growth rate and this, this exponent phi. Okay. So then the question is, well, what, what's our equilibrium variable? If we already know the growth rate and it turns out then that kind of kicks it down the road and, and your, your equilibrium variable then is, is going to be R over L because, um, Essentially, you're gonna find you know, it, it's it's still true that you got this this growth rate coming from kind of directly from parameters as we did saw in the beginning with just the pure Jones formulation, uh, but then the, the the research share is gonna be a question like what's that gonna be and that you're it's gonna kind of come out of incentives right so there's still like interesting stuff happening in terms of like the research share being an equilibrium object. Um, it's just the growth rate we kind of already know. Okay, so that's that's what we're doing there. We're gonna find SR, basically, in the end. Um, okay, so that's sort of scale effect. Some, some of that is, I mean, basically, it, it is covered in, in the end of the notes right now. Um, I haven't gone over it yet. You got a question? I heard something. Maybe that was just echoing. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so it, it's in the notes kind of, but but not entirely. So, you know, you check it out um, in the notes if you want. Uh, and then there's the long tail. This is a, this is a problem that I kind of throw out every year in certain variations because I, I don't know, I, I keep, I usually change it a little bit every year, but it's, essentially you have um, uh, same expanding varieties kind of epsilon aggregation, CES, okay? But then we're throwing in uh, what we'll call a quality factor here, okay? So this is... Um, but it's different from the Schumpeterian stuff we're doing because it's not endogenous. Okay, all this is saying is that so this QI is is fixed. It's it's actually just a function of i. Okay, so it's not like changing around from research. It's just a function of i. And all it's saying is that the higher that i is, sort of like the lower Q is. So the the lower weight you put in that into this aggregation, which is to say, so the higher that i gets, the less important these goods get. Right. You start out i equals zero is like food, shelter, water, whatever, and then you get the the luxury goods later on, okay? So it's just saying things get have a lower weight as time goes on, um, okay? And so, uh, yeah, and so maybe you think that that's gonna kill off growth, 
turns out it's not okay it's just going to change growth and then we'll see exactly like how it changes growth okay so that it's just it this is more like okay what if someone comes out and says well you know actually new products and actually the, the kind of the reason i wanted to do this problem is there's this book called the rise and fall of american growth by robert gordon uh came out a couple of years ago it's pretty good if you're interested in growth and history i think it's a good read um kind of just goes through the technological history of mostly the u.s but also to you know just i mean in many ways in the world um and how, how goods and markets have developed um but a lot of what he's saying is basically you know well all these new technology may be cool but it's not critical to to human survival and it's not as important as like uh medical advances and refrigeration and pasteurization canned goods automobiles and all that stuff okay uh air conditioning um so yeah i mean he's like an 80 year old man so this is like normal 80 year old man stuff to say uh but but i think he he puts it pretty well um so uh yeah so so that's kind of what i want to say well what if we say okay gordon you might be right let's let's throw that in and see what happens okay so you you, you basically you still get continual growth and what this alpha index here is is going to change growth but you still get continual growth okay so take that gordon um so then yeah so we're but that's just a matter of working out you have to you actually have to do some integrals which are relatively rare in growth you kind of actually literally do an integral that's not just adding stuff up because it's symmetric um so that's a little bit more complicated but um i think you guys got it um okay so that's the homework all right Any questions on that oh sorry i missed uh jacob's question ah is, okay so yeah i missed it's, it's a little bit the way the way it's set up on zoom it's a little bit harder for me to to arrange the windows but i will keep that chat visible to myself Okay, so, but thanks, Jacob, for, for getting that out there. Yep, I'm recording this now on OBS. I've got this, this setup where, I, where I, I'm basically doing exactly what I was doing on Twitch, but piping it to a virtual camera that I'm then pointing Zoom at. So uh, we can still get these on YouTube. I've been, a I was a little slow this last week on getting it up on YouTube, but now I, I, have, the, the, I have the pattern down, like how to upload it, clip it, you know, everything, so should be quicker in the future. Okay. Um, all right. So homework. Hopefully that, that's good. Let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, this is, so yeah, the, the, there's that, that scale of scale effect stuff down at the bottom of the, uh, uh, notes. It's, it's different. It's slightly different setup there cause it's lab equipment, but you can kind of get sp some inspiration there. Okay. So, all right, let's, let's, so, so we're doing, remember, back back on the electric track, uh, we're doing tributary and growth, okay? Creative distraction, I'll use those interchangeably, okay? Um, and yeah, so uh, essentially, we went through a lot of stuff last time. When we left off last time, we were, we were talking about the value function, okay? But let me, let me give you a, a, the run through here so we can remember, we start out, with this uh, aggregate, this log log aggregation, that gives us this particular demand function, okay, which is which is a little unusual because it has the property that p times y, the revenue, is constant. So these firms left to their own devices as monopolists would just go crazy and uh, try to reduce costs, which means producing as little as they can, which means setting a super high price, okay. We don't want that, and we're not going to get that because this is creative destruction. Okay, so it's it's a quality ladder, and you have you always have some person that's a lambda factor, one plus lambda factor of productivity behind you, kind of keeping you sane, honest, and your price not infinite. Okay, so um, that's good, uh, and so that's going to determine that that limit pricing. You're going to just price so that your nearest competitor is just kind of indifferent about entering or not, which is good enough. Okay. That's what you get here. This is where you set your price equal to your nearest competitor's marginal cost. Your marginal cost is W over Q, the wage divided by the productivity. Okay, that's how much it takes to produce one unit of, uh, how much it costs to produce one unit of, out of good YI. Uh, and then you just decrement that by the factor by which you're better, one plus lambda, okay? 
And you can see that if land over zero, you weren't any better than your competitor, you would price at marginal cost and make zero profits. The larger that Lambda gets, the bigger your profits because you have a bigger lead over your competitor, okay? Um, then it's just a matter of piping that through the demand function to get Y, piping it through this production function to get L, and then making sure that these YI and LI are consistent with the aggregates such as Y, capital Y, uh, and capital P, the total amount of production labor, okay? So it's the usual thing where we kind of, we have these two things. We don't really know what Y and W are, but we can get aggregate consistency cons equations to get both Y and W, okay? Um, okay, and then we do that. It takes a little bit of time, okay? But eventually we find that, for instance, Y uh, is equal to Q times P, the, the, the average aggregated productivity, the log log aggregated productivity times the amount of labor you're using, okay? And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then we can find, so this is, this is, not an expression for W, but it's an expression for P as a function of uh, W, okay? Um, and then the only other important thing is is profits, which is, which is what's going to go into the value function and the research incentives, okay? So that's saying your profits are, um, you know, lambda over one plus lambda, uh, which is something between zero and one and increases with lambda, and it's zero when lambda is zero, it's one when lambda gets infinitely large. Okay, so that's that profit curve kind of makes sense with regards to like your technological lead lambda. Okay, and then you, the y is just a scaling factor. Okay. Um. All right, so that's that's pretty much it. So now um, we're gonna take that as given. All right, so maybe I should. Uh, Uh, maybe I should, what's three, I think three is the, I have hotkeys, but I forget the hotkeys. There we go. Cool. All right. So, um, uh, okay. So back to Schumpeter. Okay. Um, all right. So let's, okay. Let me, let me just write down some of the stuff that we're going to need. Okay. So that I have that handy. So we, we've determined that y is qp, where log of q is integral from 0 to 1 of log of qi di. OK, q there. All right, um, we know you know other stuff. Well, we know like 1 equals p plus r. We know that we've got a, a unit population split between production and research. OK, um, and we know profits. We know that they're all equal across product lines. And they're equal to 1 plus lambda, sorry, lambda over 1 plus lambda times y. Okay, they're, they're a function of your technological lead. Okay. Um, I think we're going to need, we're going to want that an equation for w. Okay, so remember the equation for w uh, was um, or, well, okay, uh, how should I write this? Oh, this is one, there's many ways to write it, okay? But one way to write it is like this, okay? Now, um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that these are uh, implicitly, these. this is a, a income decomposition, okay? This one is saying this lambda over one plus lambda fraction of output goes to profits. This one is, is, you know, this is equivalent to saying WP is equal to one over one plus lambda times Y. This is saying uh, production labor gets the one over one plus lambda factor and these sum to one. Okay, so uh, that's a that's an income decomposition right there. And it turns out that those are also sort of the useful things. So so in the end, like a lot of this stuff is like the the general gist of it is that you have microstructure at the product line level, things aggregate up here, you know, they aggregate up to like something simple, like y equals q times p, okay, and it, so you get this efficient statistic phenomenon for q, capital Q, um, and then you get like income decompositions, okay, so it's like, at the end of the day, it's like kind of similar, like with Cobb-Douglas, you have a production function, and you get an income decomposition, 
here you have more microstructure, but you still get the income decomposition. In the end, you actually still get an aggregate production function. That's pretty simple. Okay, so it's but the microstructure is important because it determines exactly what is you know how does lambda map into those income shares. Okay, um, all right. So okay, that's 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 what we're gonna need for kind of from the product market side. Okay, so keep that keep we'll keep that around. All right. Now, um, so so then last time we were going in through the value function. I think. Um, so, so once we get into the value function, we start getting into these Poisson processes. Okay. Um, so, so I did want to talk a little bit about, uh, the Poisson process and like, you know, cause it's, it's pretty important and it's, it kind of relates back to a lot of the stuff on continuous time growth that we're going to be doing. Okay. And it's, it ends up being, uh, useful. Okay. So, um, all right, so now the, I forgot to look up the, so the Poisson process in general, yes, I'm going to Wikipedia because I'm looking up the, the PDF. Uh, I don't want a Poisson point process. I want a regular Poisson process. Um, actually, I just want the distribution. Okay, so so first of all, there's, there's the Poisson distribution and there's the Poisson process. Okay, so um, uh, a Poisson distribution, okay, is like a, a discrete outcome distribution. Okay, so you have a certain rate. Okay, and it's a it's a random outcome on the positive integers, uh, weekly positive integers. Okay, so that's that's a, a Poisson distribution. Okay, and the, the, I can I can write down the PMF. So so this is slash distribution. It turns out the Poisson process is based on the Poisson distribution. Okay. So that's why, I mean, it's the same, it's the same fundamental concept. Okay. Um, all right. So then the, so the, the distribution, okay. I'm, I'm just going to write down the, the PMF here. Okay. So the distribution say has some probability. Okay. Of getting like N occurrences, uh, given a rate Lambda. Okay. So that's what we're going to call the Poisson distribution. Okay. Um, and actually wait, oh yeah, we could do N. We can, do, they, they usually do K in the literature, but we'll do, we'll just do N. Okay. So, and this is going to look like Lambda to the N E to the minus Lambda over N factorial. Okay. So, um, yeah. And so, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, in terms of the, what it's going to look like, I mean, You've got this exponential term, and then, but basically you've got this geometric term. Okay, and this is going to sum to if you if you sum this from n equals zero to infinity, that's gonna that's gonna add up. Okay, so um, and uh, yeah, so this um, has some cool properties. Okay, so it's a little bit like the uh, exponential distribution, which I mentioned last time, in the sense that it's it's uh, it's it's Levy stable. Okay, so if you take two Poisson processes and and look at their sum like of the outcome, then that's also going to be Poisson distributed and the rate is going to be the sum of their individual rates. Okay. So that, remember that late, that rate here, this is confusing because we already have a Lambda floating around. This is, this is like math notation. This is in math universe here. Okay. Uh, this is different from the other Lambda. Um, this rate Lambda, uh, characterizes the process. So if you, but if you add those two together, you get the sum of, uh, a Poisson process where the rate is the sum of the, the two original rates. Okay. That's levy stable. That's that's like exponentials and normals and all the nice and friendly distributions satisfy that. Okay, um, yeah. And so that's this. This is useful. This can be useful for looking at patents. Any integer count data. Uh, it's useful because if you, if you're looking at how many patents a, a firm is filing for, for instance, per year, you could say that that's Poisson distributed. It's a it's a it's an integer number, um, and you can you can run regressions that have Poisson outcomes and, and things like that. So that's, that's always fun. Um, and it can be useful because it, it'll give you more accurate results. Okay. So, so that's the distribution. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's see. So, so it turns out that, um, for, let me get this right. You can show basically that for uh, for small lambda, okay, uh, this um, 
Poisson distribution, like the probability of it happening one or more time of, of this outcome. Okay, n. Let me let me let me see if I can say the probability that n is like you know greater than zero, uh, given lambda, uh, is approximately the lambda for small lambda. Okay. All right, you can just take a Taylor approximation uh, of. You can take a Taylor approximation of this evaluated at one, uh, for um, for small lambda, and you can get that. Okay, that's all we really need. Okay, so so what I'm saying is like. The general Poisson distribution is like a cool, interesting, and useful thing in and of itself. Really, all we need though is we're we're doing everything in, for small local time steps, okay? And so all we really need is this this linearity, okay? Um, so then to get from the Poisson distribution to the Poisson process, okay? All all we're gonna say is like um, that. Uh, let me let me get this right. So so if you have a Poisson process. With uh, rate, let's call it rate x, okay? Because that's what we're going to be using in the in the later on uh, in the in the macro side. Um, if you have a Poisson process with rate x, then uh, uh, over some time period delta, okay, then this n is distributed like a Poisson process with. Uh, uh, rate delta times with with yeah, with with uh, parameter delta times x. Okay, so this is like this is like the lambda over here. Okay, that's like this lambda. Okay, so that over you know a, a particular time period um, delta could be large or small. Actually, okay, it doesn't matter in this case for for the definition. A particular time period delta, uh, the number of occurrences of this process this thing okay it could be the number of patents or anything like that or the number of new innovations that you come up with uh it's going to be distributed that that time period delta times the rate okay and um so that's that's what characterizes a Poisson process and also it's um it's independent okay across time steps okay so if you if it has a really good outcome today it's not going to affect what happens tomorrow okay so that's that's a standard like sort of property of these types of processes okay so yeah. Um, okay, and so uh, let's see. So so yeah. I mean, if if you had a rate of 0.1, okay, we'll have we'll, when we solve these stuff, these models, we'll get like a rate of innovation. Say, so you had a rate of innovation 0.1, um, then and and you were looking over you know a one year time period, then the distribution of the number of innovations would be 0.1 a Poisson process or a Poisson distribution with the parameter 0.1, lambda equals 0.1. Uh, and then if it was five years, then it would be with 0.5. If it was 10 years, it would be one and so on. Okay, so that's that's how you can can look at like realizations of an actual Poisson process, okay? So that can be useful looking at, at delta. So it's where delta is not necessarily small here, okay? Um, but then if you kind of combine these two things, it's like, well, okay, so over some time period delta, the Poisson parameter for that number of outcomes is delta times x. And then if delta is small, that just means the probability of this thing happening at least once is delta times x. Okay, so um, yeah, so the, uh, let's see, um, is approximately equal to, to delta times x. Okay, so that that's really all we need, right, is that the probability of the thing happening is, is delta times x. Okay, uh, and and that comes out of this sort of richer setup with Poisson distributions and, and Poisson processes. Okay, um, and then there's the, the the only other thing you want to talk about is is the number of occurrences. Okay, so I'm saying at least once. Okay, uh, really all that matters is is whether it doesn't happen or it happens once. Um, the probability of it happening twice is going to be on the order of delta squared. Okay which we can ignore, okay? Because we're gonna be, we're gonna ignore higher order terms and look at delta terms and then divide them out and take and take limits. And that's that's how we usually do things. Any of this other stuff, things happening twice or three times, it's all gonna be negligible over our, our short time steps, okay? So so that should be fine too, but it's, um, 
it's a good thing though because it, it it means we don't have to get all these combinatorical sums going on with with various events that can happen okay um okay so yeah uh i think that's it um for for sort of general stuff on uh Poisson processes okay and now we're gonna apply that to a relatively simple setting of a firm that's producing making some profits and is going to randomly get booted out uh at some point by by the next competitor okay um so let's do that uh okay so this this is getting back to to value okay i don't want to get too far away from my mic here so value of the firm that is not a grammatically correct statement title but we're going to go with it um this is like a newspaper gram new, newspaper headline grammar value of firm um okay so uh yeah so what do we have here i'm gonna i, I already went over some of this derivation before okay but i just want to i want to give it to you and, and also show you how it relates to a more general process of constructing value functions in continuous time okay so um We want to construct the value of this firm, okay? And we're going to do the same thing we did last time, which is look at uh, this as a function in in a discretized setting, and then take a limit of some sort, okay? So uh, here we're going to have um, v of t, okay, is going to be equal to delta times pi uh, of t. I guess I should pi of t. Um, yeah, because 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 pi is going to be growing in our setting. Remember, because pi is is a function of y, when y is growing, it actually is is pi of t. It's going to be growing at the same rate as y, but we want to keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, v equals delta times pi of t. So this is like Riemannian integral. You know, you're you're going along, and you get you know pi today, that's this big, and then pi tomorrow is this big. And then, you know, maybe it goes down in general. But of course, it's, it's always just going to be going up deterministically here. So this is like a little delta time steps. Okay, so we're just, we're, we're, you can think about this as like kind of integrating things in the value function, okay? But we're doing it recursively, okay? So then like this whole thing is like V of T plus delta. Okay, so we're going to get, today, we're going to get delta times pi of T. Um, okay, and then, uh, then we want to, we want to discount um, the future, Okay. So, so in general, the way you discount the future is you say, okay, well, I'm going to multiply that by e to the minus uh, delta times r, right? So r is our, for the firm, <clears throat> we're taking r as our uh, discount rate, okay? Because it kind of gets back to that no arbitrage stuff. They can, if they, if they didn't use r as their discount rate, they could come up with some way to sort of game the system and make a little bit more money, okay? So... They're going to use R as their discount rate, okay? And then the the amount by which they discount is going to be uh, minus e to the minus delta times R, okay? So that's that's just like a consumer would discount to, okay? Um, but we're in, you know, we can do that. We could write that down, but we're in small delta land, okay? So we can always tailor approximate stuff if we want. Like, not always, but like we can in this case, all right? So uh, you could write this as... You know, at, at zero, it's one, okay? And then it decreases with delta, and it's actually gonna decrease linearly around zero, okay? So it's gonna look like one minus delta r. Okay, so, um, yes, it's like, you know, it's like, like a decreasing exponential, it's gonna have that, that exact slope at zero, okay? So you can write it like that. Um, you wanna make sure that delta r is actually less than one, so you wanna make sure that delta is small enough Okay, so here it doesn't matter. We're, we're doing this. That we're doing this like algebraically or symbolically. So uh, we could say that it's less than one. We could say that delta is super small. Uh, if you're on a computer, um, maybe you want to be a little bit more careful. You could write this actually. You could write one over one plus delta r. This is still approximately true. You know, when you go into approximations um, like this. Uh, many approximations are true okay and there's different approximations but they're they're still like sort of approximately true in the limit okay so you could also write it like this this is this is approximately true 
it's approximately equal to this and approximately equal to this for small delta. Um, so we can do that. That the only advantage is that that ensures that even if you happen to pick a delta that's a little too big, uh, it's it's not going to go negative at least. Okay. Um, right. So for us, I mean, we're not we're not on a computer, so we don't need to worry about that. So let's just do the the simplest thing, which is one minus uh, delta r. Okay. Um, so that's our discount rate now. And then. The question is what happens after that. Okay, and so here, here's where we invoke the Poisson stuff. Okay, so here uh, with probability delta times tau. So so tau, um, tau is our rate of created destruction. Okay, so that's, that's think about that as an equilibrium variable, which we will um, figure out later the value of it. Okay, um, but for now it's just, it's an equilibrium variable. Okay, we're getting we're getting kicked out at rate tau. Okay, and then if that happens, it's over. We're done. We go home. All right, we get zero forever. All right. Um, okay, and then with the remaining probability, one minus delta tau. Okay, again here you need you want this to be delta small enough that that's um, positive number. Uh, you're gonna get the continuation value, which is v of t plus delta. Boom. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is this is what you get. Um, you know, uh, okay, so so I'll show you. I'm, I'm gonna like keep this zero around as if it wasn't like a number that we can just let go of, okay, for the purposes of exposition, okay. Um, so I'm gonna treat the zero as if it was like a capital O instead of a zero, okay. It's zero still, but but I'm gonna not eliminate it right away, okay? Just so we can see how, how everything works, okay? Um, all right, so, and the reason I'm gonna do that is you can uh, kind of factor stuff out here. So, um, so one thing you can do is, is first step, keep this, keep all this stuff. You can take out the one here, okay? V of T plus Delta. Okay, V of T plus delta taking out that one here plus delta tau times zero minus V of T plus delta. Okay, so uh, now I'm saying, okay, you get some bait, you say, sorry, like what, what you were gonna get if nothing happened plus the probability that the thing happened, at least we should have another parenthesis here, times the change in your value. Probability thing happened times the change in your value. That's, that's important, okay? And then that's all discounted, okay? So that's how I'm deciding to factor uh, this particular thing out. Okay. Um, okay, and then uh, so from here, okay, and then I guess we can. I'm gonna be really thorough here and like factor all this stuff out too, because why not? All right. So we get delta tau. Uh, oops. Okay, I I killed up the discount rate. Turns out that that's not a big deal. Okay, so then we in here technically we're just counting this, but um, yep, and then zero minus v of t plus delta. Okay, so now I've factored all that stuff out. Uh, Jacob, you got a question? What's up? Yeah, so in this model, that's true. Um, we, we could, it, you could think about it as just a number that the firm is facing for now, though. Like, you know, later on when we do other models, ta like you, you could be kicked out by an entrant or you could even be kicked out by some other incumbent firm. And the total, just the total rate of all of that stuff is tau. So, so you could think about this slightly more generally as, as just some external force that kicks you out. But in this model, it, yeah, it is true that tau is only going to be coming from entrants. Mm -hmm. um to some extent so what one thing that okay so there's there's probably there's like two things that matter one is um that over short time steps it's approximately delta times tau okay so any any process which satisfied that we 
we could do this. Yeah. Now there are, I, don't, don't call me on this, but there are, I think processes that satisfy that, that don't satisfy some of the other stuff about Poisson in particular, the independence assumption. So if, if you had lack of independence, like mean reversion or something like that, um, where if you, if you do good today, you're going to do bad tomorrow or vice versa, then this value function stuff wouldn't hold up because then like, if you like, this, this is really a binary outcome, but like more, a little more generally, like if, if something happened today, then the, if that decreases the probability tomorrow, then that's going to have to show up in this V of T plus delta. That would be more complicated. So, so you need the independence and the approximate uh, linearity, basically. And that's pretty much plus all at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Greg, you have a question? Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Um. So, uh, so here we are. We've we factored out that that discount rate. Okay, and this, these are VFTs still here now. Uh, so okay, so so you know, I'm not gonna go totally crazy and factor out every single term here because that would get a little cumbersome. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start killing off some terms. So one term is here. So if you think about this, this is delta tau minus delta r times delta tau, if you, if you were to factor that out. Uh, the, de the delta squared term, we don't need those. Those are incredibly small. Okay, so uh, we're going to kill off delta squared terms. Okay. Now, okay, so then this is, um, if we kill off that delta squared term, then we're just left with delta tau, basically. Okay. So we're gonna, that, that's why we can just kind of drop the interest rate because this is already infinitesimal and the interest rate change is infinitesimal as well. Okay, so we're just gonna get delta tau uh, from this one times delta tau, okay? So um, <clears throat> that's good, uh, make things a little bit simpler. So now now we're really in, at the point where we can shuffle things around and divide and and uh, take a limit and, and turn this into a continuous time equation. But but here you can see that I'm still keeping that zero minus that I'm looking at this is the change, okay? So uh, so what we're gonna do is, well, basically if you look over on this side, this has a delta, this has a delta, but this one doesn't and this has a delta. So we wanna move that one over to the other side. Okay, so we're gonna move that one, one times V of T plus delta over here. Okay, uh, and then let's divide by delta. Okay, here, so we're gonna move this over and divide by delta, and on the right-hand side, we're gonna get pi of t uh, plus, uh, so minus r v of t plus delta plus uh, tau times zero minus v of t plus delta. Okay, so, uh, now we, we've divided, okay, now we can actually take a limit and things aren't gonna blow up, okay, that's good. So this limit, this is gonna be, because the delta's on the right-hand side, this is actually gonna be minus V dot, okay? That's gonna be equal to pi, I'm dropping T's here because we don't need them. Minus R, this delta just, you know, that, that becomes V of T, so this is just V, uh, and then plus tau times zero minus V, okay? Still keeping that zero around, um, okay? And then let's just move that R over. Okay, so it looks like what we had before. RV minus V dot is equal to pi plus tau times zero minus V. Okay, so that's keeping the zero around. That's that's the equation we're gonna get. Okay, so now, um, <clears throat> so this, this is, okay, let me, this V looks like a weird, combination of R and V. Let's make this a proper V. Okay, so so what's going on here is is kind of a general form. Well, I'm going to call it general form for figuring out what value functions should look like in continuous time. Left-hand side, that same RV minus V dot construction that we see in here, we see in Hamiltonian stuff. It's it's sort of like, it, it, it's, it's something you see a lot. Equal to your flow rate, uh, you know, flow um, utility value, whatever you want to call it. Um, this could be pi. This can be many other things. We'll see later on. It'll, it'll include other things like costs. Um, plus, uh, whatever can happen to you, okay? And and any, for any of those things that can happen to you, the probability, the flow rate, the the Poisson flow probability that they happen 
times the change in value if they do happen. Okay, so here the change in value is minus V because we go from V to zero, okay? It could be, let's say, you know, uh, up here, we, instead, of z, we had, instead of getting um, zero uh, when you exit, you get like a hundred bucks because it's like, man, sorry, that's, that's rough. Uh, we're gonna give you a hundred bucks, which is like pittance for, for a business, but why not? Okay, and uh, so, so you'd have like a hundred here minus V. Okay, so you, you could imagine, you know, other examples are um, you, you liquidate the capital that your firm has or something like that. Okay, that, that's probably more realistic. It's less of a, like a monopoly example. So um, you liquidate the capital and then you get that. So, so in general, if this wasn't zero, this would be whatever you get when you when you exit okay so um and then if you had other stuff okay you could just throw that on linearly okay and uh and that, that's again where the poisson comes in handy because if you have multiple poisson processes running okay um the probability that they happen at the same time over a small time step delta is is uh then zero but it's 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 on the order of delta squared or less okay so it, it's infinitesimal for our purposes okay so <clears throat> uh so then you can instead of having to write like you know what if i get the creative destruction shock what if i don't or like what if i get the creative destruction shock and there's like a recession or there isn't or like and my competitor goes out of business or someone else enters like all this stuff like is not gonna you don't have to look at the the probabilities in terms of like interactions combinatorically okay you just look at what if i get the creative destruction shock what if my competitor enters? What if my competitor exits? Or what if they expand? Okay, so um, that you can do independently and additively. Okay, and that that's again from from kind of a property of, of these Poisson processes. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's cool. All right, and so so here you know, and so in this case you know because that zero is your is your exit value. This is in fact pi minus tau v. If we if we actually accept that the zero is in fact zero, and then you can also write if you if you move that tau over you get sort of what we had last time, okay, like this, that you have some effective discount rate, R plus tau, uh, and then you have um, pi, okay? So, so yeah, so that's the general approach for, for value functions. Um, oops. That's the general approach for, for value functions. Uh, we can use that in our particular case exactly like this, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so then, uh, yeah, so, so let's then uh, move on into taking that value function and, and doing something with it, okay? So here, uh, essentially what we're gonna do is the same thing that we always do, just divide by V, okay? We're gonna divide this by V, and so we get R plus tau minus v dot over v, okay, is equal to uh, pi over v, okay? So divide by v, that way we get this growth rate of v, okay? Um, all right, and then uh, you can use that, you can solve for v itself is pi divided by uh, r uh, minus gv, that's what I'm calling this gv here now, okay, uh, plus tau. Okay, so that's that's what we're gonna get. Um, okay, uh, so that's yeah. I mean that's pretty much it. So this is this is our value. Okay, it looks similar to before. It's just we have this extra tau going in our effective discount rate. Okay, that's that's really the only difference. Um, and so you can see one dynamic here is that. The, the more innovation that's happening, uh, the larger that tau is and the lower that your, your value is going to be. So you really are kind of, if people do innovation, they, are, they, are, they really are imposing on other firms because it creates this probability that the other firm is going to get kicked out. Effectively, it lowers their discount rate. Okay, so that's going to be, <clears throat> that's going to be an inefficiency, right? The social planner doesn't care about that. They just care about, are you improving productivity? Or are you not okay? Uh, they don't care who's producing exactly. Um, firms they want to be the ones producing. Okay, so this is going to induce artificially short time horizons because they have this extra tau factor here. Okay, um, yeah. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
Okay, so then, so that's that's pretty much it for value. Now we can plug that into the free entry condition. Okay. Um, so. Okay, so our. Let's see. Our we need we need we need to think about entry basically. Okay, we need to think about entry. Um, so here. We we need to be clear on our uh, um, production technology. Okay, so let me let me make sure that I'm getting the right coefficient here when I when I talk about the research production function. Okay, so we're using okay we're gonna use gamma as our as our coefficient for the research production function. So the aggregate like the aggregate re research production function, the aggregate specification is gonna be tau is equal to gamma times r. Okay. What that means on an individual level is just that um, if you're a researcher that's like trying to enter, come up with an idea and enter, you have a flow rate gamma of succeeding, okay? And if there are researchers, then um, the total rate is going to be gamma times R, okay? And that's going to be our, our rate of creative destruction, okay? So that's, uh, it's simultaneously a definition of the production function and a statement of what is the rate of creative destruction. Uh, Jacob? Yeah. Gamma is exogenous, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're in, in, in terms of Jones, we're, we're in, uh, we're actually, so, so we're in the knife edge, knife edge case in Jones, actually, because, uh, uh, R, so, so in terms of Jones, this clearly has eight equals one. There's no decreasing returns to, uh, research here. Okay. Um, and now it looks like phi equals zero because there's no, uh, dependence of like anything else here. Uh, but it actually is phi equals one because, because of Lambda. Okay. Because Lambda is proportional because your improvement on Q is proportional, it, it's effectively like a phi equals one case, okay? So we're, we're, in, we're again in that knife edge case, okay? Um, all right, so then uh, what does this portend for uh, the free entry condition? So for the free entry condition, you can think about it as, as uh, an indifference condition between being a researcher and being a producer, okay? So if you're a researcher with probability gamma, you succeed, and in that case, you get V, you get a new product line, okay? Uh, and then that should be equal to what you had, would have gotten if you were a producer, production worker, which would be W. Okay, so gamma V equals W, which is basically the same as we usually see, same as we saw last time. Okay, so almost the same. Um, all right, so that's that's our free condition, right? And at this point, we know, we know V, we know W, and we, it's just a matter of of solving for whatever r, whatever our equilibrium variable is, okay? Um, yeah, and then we, we also need to decide on what gv is and everything like that. Okay, so um, let's okay, let, let's talk about gv for a second. Okay, so what is, this, this is a common, you know, common issue, figuring out what is gv, especially in the case where you might not necessarily know that you're you're not going to have uh, transient dynamics okay um, so GV <clears throat> uh, so if, if you work off this equation you know you have you have a ratio here where like multiple things can be changing we know that y that pi we know that pi let me just scroll up here we know that pi is growing at rate y okay um, and then if you try and if you if you try and use that directly to map into v, well, like it could be that pi is changing, you know, pi is growing at rate y, but then tau is changing or r is changing. Like we we, we don't really have a way to pin all this stuff down. Um, and so that for that reason, it's better to use the free entry condition. Assume that you have continual positive entry. In that case, you're going to get this strong linkage between the growth rate of v and the growth rate of w. Okay, so this this just right here already means that gv is equal to GW, okay? Um, and then for GW, remember we have W here. We know that W is this 
constant one over one plus lambda times y over p. So gw is gy minus gp, okay? This is gy minus gp, okay? Um, and then let's keep going with that. What is gy? Well, y is q times p. So gy is gq, which I'm going to call g, okay? Uh, uh, minus, no, sorry, plus gp, okay? So gy is, is, so gy is g plus gp, and we're subtracting gp, so then this is just g, okay? This, that's g, the growth rate of our technology index q, all right? So that's good. That's, that makes things simpler. Um, we don't have to mess around with growth rate of p or anything like that. Okay, so um, cool. Uh, so that's that's going to be uh, gb there. Now, um, there is the issue of, yep. Ah, so this is, let me, let me, let me be explicit here. So, so we know like, uh, so from up top, we know that GY is equal to G, which is GQ plus uh, GP. Okay. So then this is like G plus GP coming from GY minus uh, the original GP here. Okay. And so then those P GPs cancel. Right. Yep. Um, Okay, so that's good because so GB is just G, but you know, Q Q is defined as uh, is this it's this index here. So we're gonna see. Th I mean, this this is this growth in Q is coming from 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 these tau innovations. Okay. So we'll see we'll see what that g growth rate is also as a function of tau, but for now we can just leave that as g. But but really, I mean, we're we're defining q as this, and then that's how q affects y. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, all right. So so we 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 got off easy on gv um, for r. Okay. So remember, r is rho plus gc. That's an that's our Euler equation, okay. Um, so here, remember uh, consumption. There's no savings here, okay. And all the research stuff happens on the labor side, so um, people just consume output. So C is equal to Y, okay. Um, so this is uh, rho plus G Y, okay. Now, and then we know what G Y is. We know that's uh, uh, that's rho. Oops. We know gy is is g plus gp. So this is rho plus g plus gp. Not g rho. That'd be weird. Okay, gp. Okay, so we know that gc is equal to gy. Gy is equal to that growth rate of q plus whatever transient dynamics are happening in production side. Okay, so this this GP is going to be zero in like a steady state. Remember, okay, so uh, so R is rho plus G plus GP. Okay, yeah, yep, yep. So there's no there's no capital or anything like that. So they they're just they're just consuming output. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so then let's bring that back. Remember, our denominator was R minus GV plus tau. Okay, so so let's you know if we just think about R, that R minus GV term, the tau is going to stick around. R minus GV, then is going to be, <clears throat> we can just work from here. So it's going to be rho plus G, plus GP, minus G. So it's just going to be rho plus GP. Okay, so we we actually still do get the the transient dynamics showing up. It's just that they show up in R instead of uh, GV. Okay. Um, all right, and so then, so this is still important, but in terms of V, 
that means we're going to have pi divided by r minus gv, which we know now is g plus gp, and then plus tau. Okay, uh, Guillermo, your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this GP, GP is, yeah, it's production workers. Yeah, this 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 is gonna be zero in in a in like a steady state BGP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so this is our this is our value. All right, we know pi. Yep. This is so this is this is from. This is from here, basically. We're saying each researcher has a probability gamma of succeeding, a full probability. And then as a result, if you aggregate up, then uh, it goes linearly. So then the total rate is gamma times r. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so this is like, you know, it, yeah, there's no decreasing returns. There's no you know, two people come up with the same idea without realizing it, stuff like that. All of that we're assuming away and saying it's just totally independent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, Guillermo, you got a, you, you got a question or is that the old, that's the, you, okay. You're good. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> all right. So, so let's figure out what we need to know. We, we essentially know everything we need to. The, the only thing we haven't done is find out what exactly tau is, okay? Um, so that we can we can plug that in with full like knowledge of, of what it is uh, in here, okay? So we but we know pi, hence v, um, and we know w from earlier, okay? And so we're pretty good in that department, okay? So um, let's do a I'm gonna erase this. Let's do a, let's do a sidebar here on tau. All right, I should. Okay, and then we know what tau is. We don't. We haven't. We haven't figured out exactly what g is. Okay, sorry, I misspoke earlier. But I guess we don't really need to know that um, when we solve things. So, so let's 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 just do that later. Okay, so we can we can already basically solve for everything here. Okay, so what we want to do is I guess we can we can do it over on this side. We want to plug in for the free entry condition. Okay, um, so what are we going to get? We're going to get gamma pi over rho plus gp plus tau is equal to w okay um and then uh let's start plugging stuff in so we're gonna get gamma here and then uh for pi remember that's lambda over one plus lambda times y okay and that's all divided by rho plus gp Plus uh, tau, well, we know tau is gamma r. Okay, so that's that's pretty straightforward. Okay, um, cool. Uh, and then w, um, w, we know. Let me just go back up and figure out. So w is one over one plus lambda times y over p. Okay. W here is uh, one over one plus lambda times y over p. All right, cool. So, uh, so now we're, we're going to be solving for, uh, R basically. Okay. So this is also equal to one over one plus Lambda times Y over one minus R. Okay. So now R here, R here, we got GP. So we know GP, like, like just GP is P dot over P, uh, and it's also equal to, uh, minus r dot over one minus r. Okay, so it's 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 a thing. Um, it's going to be zero eventually, uh, for the same reasons we, we usually see. Um, but it, we can express that in terms of r. Okay, so um, okay, so basically we have a bunch of we have a big equation that's a function of r. Okay, um, all right. So now. So we can we can we can solve this. This is going to look really similar to what we saw in the expanding varieties setup, um, uh, both in the decentralized equilibrium and in the social planner, um, in the sense that we're going to get you know r dot 
is equal to you know, some stuff times 1 minus r times r minus r star. I might have gotten the signs wrong here, but we're going to get a quadratic form, okay? And we're going to find this r star to be sort of like the, the right way to go right right from the beginning. Okay, so same same story there, okay? And for that reason, okay, I think I have it worked out in the notes, um, but, but for that reason, I'm not gonna go through the full gory details of the potentially dynamic equilibrium that ends up not being that dynamic, okay? I'm just gonna say GP is zero, let's, let's solve for R, okay? Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's do that. Okay, let's jump down here and just take this equation uh, for, with, with GP equals zero. And, and we know that's how it's going to turn out in the end anyway. All right, so uh, gamma. We're going to be able to cancel stuff in a second too, but I'm just going to write this out for now. So it's gamma r is equal to 1 over 1 plus lambda times uh, y over 1 minus r. Okay, so that's our um, that's our equation. This is this is going to be that that r star. This is our, our star is going to satisfy this. Okay. Once we assume GP equals zero, then it, it just becomes an algebraic thing rather than a whole differential equation rigmarole. Okay. Um, okay. So we can cancel some stuff. Uh, in particular, we can cancel Y. Okay. So it turns out that Y just kind of comes in proportionally on both sides. So let's cancel that. Right. Um, we can cancel one plus Lambda. Why not? Um, and then everything else is kind of, we need to we need to keep that around. Okay, so we're gonna get gamma lambda over rho plus gamma r is equal to uh, one over one minus r. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so now of course we can solve this, right? This is gonna be a linear equation. We can solve this. Uh, let's think about what it means first for a second, though. Okay, so this is essentially you know that that free entry condition. Okay, you can think about that as like a marginal benefit equals marginal cost thing, right? The marginal benefit is uh, the probability you succeed times the value of succeeding, okay? Um, and then the marginal cost, this is like a marginal, it's like the marginal opportunity cost saying, okay, well, I could have been a production worker. I'm going to be a research worker instead. That's like an opportunity cost, okay? So this is marginal benefit equals marginal cost calculation, okay? And here you can see exactly how those things depend on R. Okay, so R is an equilibrium variable. In the end, what we're saying, R should adjust, uh, or like things should adjust until R is at a point such that the marginal benefit of doing innovation is equal to the marginal cost of innovation, okay? So, um, and if you think about like, you, know, you can plot it out, okay, and you can see exactly what these things are gonna look like, okay? Think about, R here on our axis, okay? And, um, yeah, okay, so then what do we have? So, so we're gonna have a natural sort of upper bound point at one where this thing, this marginal cost is gonna go to infinity. When, when R goes to one, the marginal cost goes to infinity because as R goes to one, production goes to zero, marginal utility goes to infinity, people start freaking out, okay? So, um, Okay, uh, that's going to be our, our asymptote. And then at, at uh, let's see, at zero, I'm, part, I'm plotting out the marginal cost right now. At zero, this is one. Okay, when r equals zero, it's one. Okay, and then, uh, wait, I need the old anti-fouling glove to actually draw curves here, which is apparently the technical term for this glove, okay? Uh, it's not still not gonna be a good curve, but it's gonna be better, All right? Um, it's gonna look like that, okay? I think the slope should be zero. Uh, maybe it's not zero, I don't know. Okay, so it's gonna look something like that and it's gonna asymptote at one. Okay, so that's our marginal cost curve, okay? And then the marginal benefit, all right? That's gonna be like, you know, say up here, okay? When r equals zero, it's gamma lambda over rho. All right, that's gonna look like, say it starts here and then goes down like this. All right, so it's not gonna be like, it looks kind of linear here, but it's not necessarily linear. And then there's some intersection point, right? So this is marginal benefit here. 
there's some intersection point. This is super high. Of course, this is like 40%. This is way too high for anything we've ever seen empirically, but let's you know imagine that it was like you know 5% or something even less. Okay. So there's gonna be some intersection point. All right, sorry. So but but the general intuition is okay, marginal cost is opportunity cost is going up because we're taking away from production and we're getting close to sort of like a not a condition stuff. Okay. Um and then uh marginal benefit. Well, essentially, like the marginal benefit, this is private marginal benefit, I should say. Not social. Okay. This is private marginal benefit. This is part of where the inefficiency comes from, actually. Your private marginal benefit goes down with R because more R means more tau, which means more creative destruction, which means your value is less. Okay, your discount rate's higher. So that the fact that you're getting you're getting destroyed randomly is what's pushing down this marginal benefit curve. Okay. If um if you like had the true sort of social time discounting, this would be more like a flat curve, okay? And you'd have a higher intersection. That's that's essentially the inefficiency. But here you have this artificially short time horizons from tau that makes this marginal benefit curve go down with R and that, that lowers the uh, intersection point there, okay? Um, okay, uh, yeah, so like what we're gonna see later on is gonna be like, we'll have like a, if you, if you, if you think about like the social Marginal benefit, it's going to look like this. Okay, the social mar marginal benefit will look like that. You'll have like a higher intersection. That's sort of a dotted line. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, this, the, the curve doesn't shift. It's just you're move when your R goes up, you're moving along this curve. This Because this curve is R. Yep. Um, so, so it's not, it, the, the, so this is the private curve, the private marginal benefit curve. If you thought about the social marginal benefit curve, it would be like basically a flat line because of the, with the social marginal benefit, if you do innovation, you improve productivity and output, you don't really, you, you're not worried about who's producing about the firm or anything like that. So it's just going to be a straight flat line like this. And so if you thought about the social optimum, that would be the intersection of the social marginal benefit. And, the, and the, this, is, this is actually common to both social and private, the marginal cost. Um, and so the, if you thought about a, a, a social planner, they would, they would think about it like this, whereas the firm has short time horizons because it's tau, and they think about it like this. Um, yeah, so th th I mean, this would shift in response to parameters, for instance, if gamma changed or anything like that, this would shift, but uh, it's not gonna be shifting like, yeah, we're not, we're not thinking about it shifting for any, for any equilibrium. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, and, and I actually share like if gamma, it's kind of interesting. What happened, if, what would happen if you increased gamma? Um, it's actually ambiguous. Cause like the, the zero point would go up. Right. But then, uh, The would it, yeah, I guess it would. Uh, but the curve, yeah, may, maybe it would go up. Yeah, maybe actually it would go up. So if gamma goes up, you get more innovation. I guess that makes sense. Okay, so you could you could try and do some comparative statics with this, too. It's not always uh, unambiguous, but you you could do comparative statics with this uh, type of setup. Okay, um, certainly if like lambda went up, okay, that would shift this whole curve upwards. And you'd see an increase in research, which, which makes sense, right? Um, okay, so then, so that's the graphical approach. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay, you can also solve this. We may, we have all this time, all this way. We may as well solve it. Okay, so if you if you cross multiply, you get this. Okay, and then group some common terms together, like that. Okay, and then divide, you're gonna get your R star is gamma lambda minus rho over gamma times one plus lambda, or if you want, you can divide through the gamma so you get lambda minus rho over gamma over one plus lambda. Okay, so you're gonna get an expression for R star. It's kind of similar to before. Um, oh, Greg, I missed your old, is that? Oh, that, the, okay, you just asked that uh, verbally. Okay, so I, I missed, don't really see the chat. Um, you got your R star is, you know, it's something that might be 
it might hit zero for certain parameters just like before makes kind of you know sense in terms of uh discount rates and and productivity of research um and then the lambda is going to be a little bit ambiguous i guess uh I don't think it's actually ambiguous, but you need to think about take a derivative there. Okay, so so you get you that's what you get for your um, research here. Okay, and then at this point, it just is you know, standard mapping up from fundamentals. So you can get uh, tau is uh, gamma r, right? Which would that would be the gamma lambda minus rho over one plus lambda. Okay, uh, you can get that, and then you can get g. So now. This is this is one thing I didn't really get to. What is g? Well, it turns out g is going to be log of one plus lambda times tau. Okay, and that's not obvious immediately uh, why that happens. I mean, it relates to the fact that we have log log aggregation. So I'll derive this why this is true uh, next time. But but that's that's what we're going to get. Okay, and then next time we'll also go over the the social planner for uh, for the Schumpeterian creative destruction model as well. Okay, so yeah, um, that's it for now. Uh, any remaining questions uh, about that or shall we convene till next time? Okay, seems like you guys are good. Um, cool, thank you for coming and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. No, today's Wednesday. Uh, let's get this straight. I'll see you on Monday and have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Right,